Mm. Okay, interesting. But, but anyway, that, that's neither here nor there. Let's um, uh, let's get on with it. Um, the House of Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne. One, the old Pinchian family. Halfway down a by street of one of our New England towns stands a rusty wooden house with seven acutely peaked gables facing towards various points of the compass and a huge clustered chimney in the midst. The street is Pinchian Street. The house is the old Pinchian house, and an elm tree of wide circumference rooted before the door is familiar to every town-born child by the title of the Pinchian Elm. On my occasional visits to the town aforesaid, I seldom failed to turn down Pinchian Street for the sake of passing through the shadow of these two antiquities, the great elm tree and the weather-beaten edifice. The aspect of the venerable mansion has always affected me like a human countenance, bearing the traces not merely of outward storm and sunshine, but expressive also of the long lapse of mortal life and accompanying vicissitudes that have passed within. Were these to be worthily recounted, they would form a narrative of no small interest and instruction, and possessing, moreover, a certain remarkable unity, which might almost seem the result of artistic arrangement. But the story would include a chain of events extending over the better part of two centuries, and written out with reasonable amplitude would fill a bigger folio volume or a longer series of duodecimos than could prudently be appropriated to the annals of all New England during a similar period. It consequently becomes imperative to make short work with most of the traditionary law of which the old Pinchian house, otherwise known as the House of the Seven Gables, has been the theme. With a brief sketch, therefore, of the circumstances amid which the foundation of the house was laid, and a rapid glimpse at its quaint exterior as it grew black in the prevalent east wind, pointing to here and there at some spot of more verdant mossiness on its roof and walls, we shall commence the real action of our tale at an epoch not very remote from the present day. Still, there will be a connection with the long past, a reference to forgotten events and personages, and to manners, feelings, and opinions, almost or wholly obsolete, which, if adequately translated to the reader, would serve to illustrate how much of old material goes to make up the freshest novelty of human life. Hence, too, might be drawn a weighty lesson from the little regarded truth, <clears throat> that the act of the passing generation is the germ which may and must produce good or evil fruit in a far distant time, that together with the seed of the merely temporary crop which mortals term expediency, they inevitably sow the acorns of a more enduring growth which may darkly overshadow their posterity. The house, <clears throat> excuse me. The house of the Seven Gables, antique as it now looks, was not the first habitation erected by civilized man on precisely the same spot of ground. Pinchian Street formerly bore the humbler appellation of Mall's Lane, from the name of the original occupant of the soil, before whose cottage door it was a cow path a natural spring of soft and pleasant water, a rare treasure on the sea-girt peninsula where the Puritan settlement was made, had early introduced Matthew Mall to build a hut, shaggy with thatch at this point, although somewhat too remote from what was then the center of the village. In the growth of the town, however, after some thirty or forty years, the site covered by this rude hovel had become exceedingly desirable in the eyes of a prominent and powerful personage, 
who asserted plausible claims to the proprietorship of this and a large adjacent tract of land on the strength of a grant from the legislature. Colonel Pinchian, the claimant, as we gathered... Fr- blah, 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 blah. One second, just turning my uh, phone off here. Boom, there we go. Uh, Colonel Pinchian, the claimant, as we gather from whatever traits of him are preserved, was characterized by an iron energy of purpose. Matthew Maul, on the other hand, though an obscure man, was stubborn in the defense of what he considered his right, and for several years he succeeded in protecting the acre or two of earth which, with his own toil, he had hewn out of the primeval forest to be his garden ground and homestead. No written record of this dispute is known to be in existence. Our acquaintance with the whole subject is derived chiefly from tradition. It would be bold, therefore, and possibly unjust, to venture a decisive opinion as to its merits, although it appears to have been at least a matter of doubt whether Colonel Pinchian's claim were not unduly stretched in order to make it cover the small meets and bounds of Matthew Maul. What greatly strengthens such a suspicion is the fact that this controversy between the two ill-matched antagonists, at a period, moreover, lord it as we may, when personal influence had far more weight than now, remained for years undecided, and came to a close only with the death of the party occupying the disputed soil. The mode of his death, too, affects the mind differently in our day from what it did a century and a half ago. It was a death that blasted with strange horror the humble name of the dweller in the cottage, and made it seem almost a religious act to drive the plow over the little area of his habitation, and obliterate his place and memory from among men." Old Matthew Maul, in a word, was executed for the crime of witchcraft. He was one of the martyrs to that terrible delusion which should teach us, among its other morals, that the influential classes and those who take upon themselves to be leaders of the people are fully liable to all the passionate error that has ever characterized the maddest mob clergymen, judges, statesmen, the wisest, calmest, holiest persons of their day, stood in the inner circle round about the gallows, loudest to applaud the work of blood, latest to confess themselves miserably deceived. If any one part of their proceedings can be said to deserve less blame than another, it was the singular indiscrimination with which they persecuted not merely the poor and aged, as in former judicial massacres, but people of all ranks, their own equals, brethren and wives. Amid the disorder of such various ruin, It is not strange that a man of inconsiderable note, like Maul, should have trodden the martyr's path to the hill of execution, almost unremarked in the throng of his fellow sufferers. But, in after days, when the frenzy of that hideous epoch had subsided, it was remembered how loudly Colonel Pinchian had joined in the general cry to purge the land from witchcraft nor did it fail to be whispered that there was an invidious acrimony in the zeal with which he had sought the condemnation of Matthew Maul. It was well known that the victim had recognized the bitterness of personal enmity in his persecutor's conduct towards him, and that he declared himself hunted to death for his spoil. At the moment of execution, with the halter about his neck, and while Colonel Pinchian sat on horseback, grimly gazing at the scene, Maul had addressed him from the scaffold, and uttered a prophecy, of which history, as well as fireside tradition, has preserved the very words. God, said the dying man, pointing his finger with a ghastly look, at the undismayed countenance of his enemy. 
God will give him blood to drink. After the reputed wizard's death, his humble homestead had fallen an easy spoil into Colonel Pynchion's grasp. When it was understood, however, that the colonel intended to erect a family mansion spacious, ponderously framed of oaken timber, and calculated to endure for many generations of his posterity, over the spot first covered by the log-built hut of Matthew Maul, there was much shaking of the head among the village gossips, without absolutely expressing a doubt whether the stalwart Puritan had acted as a man of conscience and integrity throughout the proceedings which had been sketched. They, nevertheless, hinted that he was about to build his house over an unquiet grave. His home would include the home of the dead and buried wizard, and would thus afford the ghost of the latter a kind of privilege to haunt its new apartments and the chambers into which future bridegrooms were to lead their brides, and where children of the Pinchian blood were to be born. The terror and ugliness of Maul's crime and the wretchedness of his punishment would darken the freshly plastered walls and infect them early with the scent of an old and melancholy house. Why, then, while so much of the soil around him was bestrewn with the virgin forest leaves, why should Colonel Pynchion prefer a site that had already been accursed? But the Puritan soldier and magistrate was not a man to be turned aside from his well-considered scheme, either by dread of the wizard's ghost or by flimsy sentimentalities of any kind, however specious. Had he been told of a bad air, it might have moved him somewhat, but he was ready to encounter an evil spirit on his own ground. Endowed with common sense, as massive and hard as blocks of granite, Fastened together by stern rigidity of purpose, as with iron clamps, he followed out his original design, probably without so much as imagining an objection to it. On the score of delicacy, or any scrupulousness which a finer sensibility might have taught him, the colonel, like most of his breed and generation, was impenetrable. He therefore dug his cellar and laid the deep foundations of his mansion on the square of earth whence Matthew Maul, forty years before, had first swept away the fallen leaves. It was a curious, and as some people thought, an ominous fact, that very soon, after the workmen began their operations, the spring of water, above mentioned, entirely lost the deliciousness of its pristine quality. Whether its sources were disturbed by the depth of the new cellar, or whatever subtler cause might lurk at the bottom, it is certain that the water of Maul's well, as it continued to be called, grew hard and brackish. Even such we find it now and any old woman of the neighborhood will certify that it is productive of intestinal mischief to those who quench their thirst there. The reader may deem it singular that the head carpenter of the new edifice was no other than the son of the very man from whose dead gripe the property of the soil had been wrested. I suspect that that word is supposed to be grip. I think we've got a typo. That's okay. The reader may deem it singular that the head carpenter of the new edifice was no other than the son of the very man from whose dead grip the property of the soil had been wrested. Not improbably, he was the best workman of his time. Or perhaps the colonel thought it expedient or was impelled by some better feeling thus openly to cast aside all animosity against the race of his fallen antagonist. Nor was it out of keeping with the general coarseness and matter-of-fact character of the age that the son should be willing to earn an honest penny 
or rather a weighty amount of sterling pounds, from the purse of his father's deadly enemy. At all events, Thomas Small became the architect of the House of the Seven Gables, and performed his duty so faithfully that the timber framework fastened by his hands still holds together. Thus the great house was built, familiar as it stands in the writer's recollection, for it has been an object of curiosity with him from boyhood, both as a specimen of the best and stateliest architecture of a long-past epoch, and as the scene of events more full of human interest, perhaps, than those of a grey feudal castle. Familiar as it stands, in its rusty old age, it is therefore only the more difficult to imagine the bright novelty with which it first caught the sunshine. The impression of its actual state, at this distance of a hundred and sixty years, darkens inevitably through the picture which we would fain give of its appearance on the morning when the Puritan magnate bade all the town to be his guests. A ceremony of consecration, festive as well as religious, was now performed. A prayer and discourse from the Reverend Mr. Higginson, and the outpouring of a psalm from the general throat of the community, was to be made acceptable to the grosser sense by ale, cider, wine, and brandy, in copious effusion. And, as some authorities uh, aver, by an ox roasted whole, or at least by the weight and substance of an ox in more manageable joints and sirloins. The carcass of a deer, shot within twenty miles, had supplied material for the vast circumference of a pasty. A codfish of sixty pounds, caught in the bay, had been dissolved into the rich liquid of a chowder. The chimney of the new house, in short, belching forth its kitchen smoke, impregnated the whole air with the scent of meats, fowls, and fishes, spicily concocted with odiferous herbs and onions in, in abundance. The mere smell of such festivity making its way to everybody's nostrils was at once an invitation and an appetite. Malls Lane or Pinchian Street, as it were now more decorous to call it, was thronged at the appointed hour as with a congregation on its way to church. All, as they approached, looked upward at the imposing edifice which was henceforth to assume its rank among the habitations of mankind. There it rose, a little withdrawn from the line of the street, but in pride, not modesty. The whole visible exterior was ornamented with quaint figures conceived in the grotesqueness of a Gothic fancy, and drawn or stamped in the glittering plaster, composed of lime, pebbles, and bits of glass with which the woodwork of the walls was overspread. On every side the seven gables pointed sharply towards the sky and presented the aspect of a whole sisterhood of edifices breathing through the spiracles of one great chimney. The many lattices, with their small, diamond-shaped panes, admitted the sunlight into hall and chamber, while, nevertheless, the second story, projecting far over the base and itself retiring beneath the third, threw a shadowy and thoughtful gloom into the lower rooms. Carved globes of wood were affixed under the jutting stories. Little spiral rods of iron boatified each of the seven peaks. On the triangular portion of the gable that fronted next to the street was a dial put up that very morning and on which the sun was still marking the passage of the first bright hour in a history that was not destined to be all so bright. All around were scattered shavings, chips, shingles, and broken halves of bricks. These, together with the lately turned earth, on which the grass had not begun to grow, contributed to the impression of strangeness and novelty 
proper to a house that had yet its place to make among men's daily interests. The principal entrance, which had almost the breadth of a church door, was in the angle between the two front gables, and was covered by an open porch with benches beneath its shelter. Under this arched doorway, scraping their feet on the unworn threshold, now trod the clergymen, the elders, the magistrates, the deacons, and whatever of aristocracy there was in town or country. Thither, too, thronged the plebeian classes as freely as their betters, and in larger number. Just within the entrance, however, stood two serving men, pointing some of the guests to the neighborhood of the kitchen, and ushering others into the statelier rooms, hospitable alike to all, but still with a scrutinizing regard to the high or low degree of each. Velvet garments, somber but rich, stiffly plaited ruffs and bands, embroidered gloves, venerable beards, the mien and countenance of authority made it easy to distinguish the gentleman of worship at that period from the tradesman with his plodding air, or the laborer in his leathern jerkin, stealing awe-stricken into the house which he had perhaps helped to build. This is a pretty impressive house. Pretty impressive house. I'm getting the, uh, the impression it's going to be haunted, though. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll find out. One inauspicious circumstance there was, which awakened a hardly concealed displeasure in the breasts of a few of the more punctilious visitors. The founder of this stately mansion, a gentleman noted for the square and ponderous courtesy of his demeanor, ought surely to have stood in his own hall, and to have offered the first welcome to so many eminent personages as here presented themselves in honor of his solemn festival. He was as yet invisible. The most favored of the guests had not beheld him. This sluggishness on Colonel Pinchian's part became still more unaccountable when the second dignitary of the province made his appearance and found no more ceremonious a reception. The lieutenant governor, although his visit was one of the anticipated glories of the day, had alighted from his horse and assisted his lady from her side saddle and crossed the colonel's threshold without other greeting than that of the principal domestic. This person, a grey-headed man of quiet and most respectable deportment, found it necessary to explain that his master still remained in his study, or private apartment, on entering which, an hour before, he had expressed a wish on no account to be disturbed. "'Do you not see, fellow,' said the high sheriff of the county, taking the servant aside, "'that this is no less a man than the lieutenant governor. Summon Colonel Pinchian at once.' I know that he received letters from England this morning, and... Oh, is this the... Who's that? Ah, uh, yeah. Summon, yes, summon Colonel Pinchian at once. I know that he received letters from England this morning, and in the perusal and consideration of them, an hour may have passed away without his noticing it. But he will be ill-pleased, I judge, if you suffer him to neglect the courtesy due to one of our chief rulers, and who may be said to represent King William." In the absence of the governor himself, call your master instantly. Nay, please your worship, answered the man in much perplexity, but with a backwardness that strikingly indicated the hard and severe character of Colonel Pinchian's domestic rule. My master's orders were exceeding strict, and as your worship knows, he permits of no discretion in the obedience of those who owe him service. Let who list... Open yonder door. I dare not, though the governor's own voice should bid me do it. Pooh, pooh, Master High Sheriff, cried the lieutenant governor, who had overheard the foregoing discussion, and felt himself high enough in station to play a little with his dignity. I will take the matter into my own hands. It is time that the good colonel came forth to greet his friends, 
else we shall be apt to suspect that he has taken a sip too much of his canary wine. In his extreme deliberation, which cask it were best to broach in honour of the day. But since he is so much behindhand, I will give him a remembrancer myself. Accordingly, with such a tramp of his ponderous riding boots, as might of itself have been audible in the remotest of the seven gables, he advanced to the door, which the servant pointed out and made its new panels re-echo with a loud, free knock. Then, looking round with a smile to the spectators, he awaited a response. As none came, however, he knocked again, but with the same unsatisfactory result as at first. And now, being a trifle choleric in his temperament, the lieutenant-governor uplifted the heavy hilt of his sword, wherewith he so beat and banged upon that door that, as some of the bystanders whispered, the racket might have disturbed the dead. Be that as it might, it seemed to produce no awakening effect on Colonel Pynchon. When the sound subsided, the silence through the house was deep, dreary, and oppressive notwithstanding that the tongues of, a, of many of the guests had already been loosened by a surreptitious cup or two of wine or spirits. "'Strange, forsooth, very strange,' cried the lieutenant-governor, whose smile was changed to a frown. "'But seeing that our host sets us the good example of forgetting ceremony, I shall likewise throw it aside and make free to intrude on his privacy.' He tried the door, which yielded to his hand, and was flung wide open by a sudden gust of wind that passed, as with a loud sigh, from the outermost portal through all the passages and apartments of the new house. It rustled the silken garments of the ladies, and waved the long curls of the gentlemen's wigs, and shook the window hangings and the curtains of the bedchambers, causing everywhere a singular stir, which yet was more like a hush. A shadow of awe and half-fearful anticipation. Nobody knew wherefore, nor of what had all at once fallen over the company. Now you long to poo-poo some... Yeah, it was... Boy, they got some strange... Um, yeah, strange language in this book. It's, it's very, very old-timey there, aren't you? They thronged, however, to the now open door, pressing the lieutenant-governor, in the eagerness of their curiosity, into the room in advance of them. At the first glimpse they beheld nothing extraordinary, a handsomely furnished room of moderate size, somewhat darkened by curtains, books arranged on shelves, a large map on the wall, and likewise a portrait of Colonel Pynchion, beneath which sat the original Colonel himself, in an oaken elbow chair with a pen in his hand. Letters, parchments, and blank sheets of paper were on the table before him. He appeared to gaze at the curious crowd, in front of which stood the lieutenant-governor, and there was a frown on his dark and massive countenance, as if sternly resentful of the boldness that had impelled them into his private retirement. A little boy, the colonel's grandchild, and the only human being that ever dared to be familiar with him, now made his way among the guests and ran towards the seated figure. Then, Pausing halfway, he began to shriek with terror. The company, tremulous as the leaves of a tree, when all are shaking together, drew nearer and perceived that there was an unnatural distortion in the fixedness of Colonel Pynchion's stare, that there was blood on his ruff, and that his hoary beard was saturated with it. It was too late to give assistance. The iron-hearted Puritan, the relentless persecutor, the grasping and strong-willed man, was dead. Dead in his new house. There is a tradition, only worth alluding to, as lending a tinge of superstitious awe to a scene perhaps gloomy enough without it, 
that a voice spoke loudly among the guests, the tones of which were like those of old Matthew Maul, the executed wizard. God hath given him blood to drink. Thus early had that one guest, the only guest who was certain at one time or another to find his way into every human dwelling. Thus early had death stepped across the threshold of the house of the seven gables. Man, tell you what, this is uh, yeah, this is uh, starting off um, uh, much uh, much faster than the Scarlet Letter. Yeah. All right, we'll get back to it in just a second. And these chapters are kind of long too. Let me just grab uh, my thing of. Uh, oh, where's my water? Here it is. Got it. Got it. Got it. Man, this is good. I, I didn't think it was, was going to be as a straight up ghost story like that. Very good. All righty. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, parties are not good when the host is dead. That is for sure. That is for sure. Okay. Let's, uh, let's continue. A Colonel Pinchian's sudden and mysterious end made a vast deal of noise in its day. There were many rumors, some of which have vaguely drifted down to the present time, how that appearances indicated violence that there were the marks of fingers on his throat and the print of a bloody hand on his plainted ruff, and that his peaked beard was disheveled as if it had been fiercely clutched and pulled. It was averred, likewise, that the lattice window near the colonel's chair was open, and that only a few minutes before the fatal occurrence the figure of a man had been seen clambering over the garden fence in the rear of the house but it were folly to lay any stress on stories of this kind, which are sure to spring up around such an event as that now related, and which, as in the present case, sometimes prolong themselves for ages afterwards, like the toadstools that indicate where the fallen and buried trunk of a tree has long since moulded into the earth. Man! I really like that description. From a house party to a wake just that far. Yeah, boy, oh boy. Um, what? The balls are not bouncing if the owner's dead. Yeah, okay, I think. Okay, okay, right. uh, for our own part, we allow them just as little credence as to that other fable of the skeleton hand which the lieutenant governor was said to have seen at the colonel's throat, but which vanished away as he advanced farther into the room. Certain it is, however, that there was a great consultation and dispute of doctors over the dead body. One, a John Swinnerton by name, who appears to have been a man of eminence, upheld it, if we have rightly understood his term of art, to be a case of apoplexy. His professional brethren, each for himself, adopted various hypotheses, more or less plausible, but all dressed out in a perplexity. His professional brethren, each for himself, adopted various hypotheses, more or less plausible, but all dressed out in a perplexing mystery of phrase, which, if it do not show a bewilderment of mind in these erudite physicians, certainly causes it in the unlearned peruser of their opinions. The coroner's jury sat upon the corpse and, like sensible men, returned an unassailable verdict of sudden death. It is indeed difficult to imagine that there could have been a serious suspicion of murder, or the slightest grounds for implicating any particular individual as the perpetrator. The rank, wealth, and eminent character of the deceased must have ensured the strictest scrutiny into every ambiguous circumstance. As none such is on record, it is safe to assume that none existed. Tradition, which sometimes brings down truth that history has let slip, but is oftener the wild babble of the time, 
such as was formerly spoken at the fireside and now congeals in newspapers, tradition is responsible for all contrary averments. In Colonel Pynchon's funeral sermon, which was printed and is still extant, the Reverend Mr. Higginson enumerates, among the many felicities of his distinguished parishioner's earthly career, the happy seasonableness of his death. His duties all performed, the highest prosperity attained, his race and future generations fixed on a stable basis, and with a stately roof to shelter them for centuries to come. What other upward step remained for this good man to take, save the final step from earth to the golden gate of heaven? The pious clergyman surely would not have uttered words like these had he in the least suspected that the colonel had been thrust into the other world with the clutch of violence upon his throat. The family of Colonel Pynchon, at the epoch of his death, seemed destined to as fortunate a permanence as can anywise consist with the inherent instability of human affairs. It might fairly be anticipated that the progress of time would rather increase and ripen their prosperity than wear away and destroy it. For not only had his son and heir come into immediate enjoyment of a rich estate, but there was a claim through an Indian deed, confirmed by a subsequent grant of the general court, to a vast and as yet unexplored and unmeasured tract of eastern lands. These possessions, for as such they might almost certainly be reckoned, comprise the greater part of what is now known as Waldo County, in the state of Maine, and were more extensive than many a dukedom, or even a reigning prince's territory on European soil. When the pathless forest that still covered this wild principality should give place, as it inevitably must, though perhaps not till ages hence, to the golden fertility of human culture, it would be the source of incalculable wealth to the Pinchian blood. Had the colonel survived only a few weeks longer, it is probable that his great political influence and powerful connections at home and abroad would have consummated all that was necessary to render the claim available. But, in spite of good Mr. Higginson's congratulatory eloquence, this appeared to be the one thing which Colonel Pinchian, provident and sagacious as he was, had allowed to go at loose ends. So far as the prospective territory was concerned, he unquestionably died too soon. His son lacked not merely the father's eminent position, but the talent and force of character to achieve it. He could, therefore, effect nothing by dint of political interest, and the bare justice or legality of the claim was not so apparent after the colonel's decease as it had been pronounced in his lifetime. Some connecting link had slipped out of the evidence and could not anywhere be found. Efforts, it is true, were made by the Pinchians, not only then, but at various periods for nearly a hundred years afterwards, to obtain what they stubbornly persisted in deeming their right. But, in course of time, the territory was partly regranted to more favoured individuals, and partly cleared and occupied by actual settlers. These last, if they ever heard of the Pinchian title, would have laughed at the idea of any man's asserting a right on the strength of mouldy parchments signed with the faded autographs of governors and legislators long dead and forgotten to the lands which they or their fathers had wrested from the wild hand of nature by their own sturdy toil. This impalpable claim, therefore, resulted in nothing more solid than to cherish from generation to generation an absurd delusion of family importance which all along characterized the Pinchians. It caused the poorest member of the race to feel as if he inherited a kind of nobility and might yet come into the possession of 
princely wealth to support it. Good morning, Rose. Good morning. Good to see you. We missed you last week. Yeah. And I uh, had a pretty decent read last week, but yeah, no, no Rose to come in uh, and uh, join us. I hope you're able to uh, check out the VOD there. Man. Yeah. There we go. Sipping down a little more water. There we go. Yeah, so we're still in Chapter 1. Still in Chapter 1 here, uh, Rose, of uh, um, House of the Seven Gables. Tell you what, very, very, uh, very um, descriptive. Very descriptive writing so far. It's it's uh, it, it's uh, very enjoyable to read, but but it's, it's it's actually starting to take a little. Uh, this is all background, I think. I think this is this is all just setting up the scene. I'm pretty sure. I, I think it's about to pop into modern day, or at least as modern as when the book was written. Okay. Um, okay, so this, uh, so the, so the Pinchian family they lost an opportunity to get all this additional land, right? In the better specimens of the breed, this peculiarity threw an ideal grace over the hard material of human life, without stealing away any truly valuable quality. In the baser sort, its effect was to increase the liability to sluggishness and dependence, and induce the victim of a shadowy hope to remit all self-effort, while awaiting the realization of his dreams. Years and years after their claim had passed out of the public memory, the Pingians were accustomed to consult the colonel's ancient map, which had, project, which had been projected while Waldo County was still an unbroken wilderness, where the old land surveyor had put down woods, lakes, and rivers. They marked out the cleared spaces and dotted the villages and towns and calculated the progressively increasing value of the territory, as if there were yet a prospect of its ultimately forming a princedom for themselves. Uh, page, or let's see, location uh, 8%, location 331. There's no page number uh, in the Kindle thing here. In almost every generation, nevertheless, there happened to be some one descendant of the family gifted with a portion of the hard, keen sense and practical energy that had so remarkably distinguished the original founder. His character, indeed, might be traced all the way down as distinctly as if the colonel himself, a little diluted, had been gifted with a sort of interminent immortality on earth. Intermittent, sorry, intermittent immortality on earth. At two or three epochs, when the fortunes of the family were low, this representative of hereditary qualities had made his appearance and caused the traditionary gossips of the town to whisper among themselves, Here's the old Pinchy and come again. Now the seven gables will be new shingled. From father to son, they clung to the ancestral house with singular tenacity of home attachment. For various reasons, however, and from impressions often too vaguely founded to be put on paper, the writer cherishes the belief that many, if not most, of the successive proprietors of this, of this estate were troubled with doubts as to their moral right to hold it. Good morning, Dithy. Good morning. Uh, nice to see a different side of uh, Mr. Hawthorne beyond the Scarlet Letter. Oh, yeah. We, we read the Scarlet Letter last year. Yeah, uh, that, that was very interesting. Very, very, uh, very interesting. Um, blip, 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 but, yeah, but yeah, I'm, I'm not, this, this one seems more like a gothic ghost story. So far, so good, i got to say. So, okay, let's go back to it. Uh, blip, 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 blip. Uh, Okay. For various reasons, however, and from impressions often too vaguely founded to be put on paper, the writer cherishes the belief that many, if not most, of the successive proprietors of this estate were troubled with doubts as to their moral right to hold it. Of their legal tenure there could be no question, but old Matthew Maul, it is to be feared, 
trode downward from his own age to a far later one, planting a heavy footstep all the way on the conscience of a pinchian. If so, we are left to dispose of the awful query whether each inheritor of the property, conscious of wrong and failing to rectify it, did not commit anew the great guilt of his ancestor and incur all its original responsibilities. And supposing such to be the case, would it not be a far truer mode of expression to say of the Pinchian family that they inherited a great misfortune than the reverse? Okay, so I, I got a question. Um... It sounds like members of the Pinchian family know that the old um, that the old man Pinchian um, like like did away deliberately did away with Matthew Mall. It, it it sounds like they know that there there was some skullduggery going on there, and 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 that that's why they that there seems to be like this almost like guilt. Um, attached to holding holding on to the house and the properties then hmm i don't know uh, ma'am yeah okay. we have already hinted that it is not our purpose to trace down the history of the pinchian family in its unbroken connection with the house of the seven gables nor to show, as in a magic picture, how the rustiness and infirmity of age gathered over the venerable house itself. As regards its interior life, a large, dim looking-glass used to hang in one of the rooms, and was fabled to contain, within its depths, all the shapes that had ever been reflected there. The old colonel himself and his many descendants, some in the garb of antique babyhood, and others in the bloom of feminine beauty or manly prime, or saddened with the wrinkles of frosty age. Had we the secret of that mirror, we would gladly sit down before it and transfer its revelations to our page. But there was a story, for which it is difficult to conceive any foundation, that the posterity of Matthew Maul had some connection with the mystery of the looking-glass, and that, by what appears to have been a sort of mesmer mesmeric process, they could make its inner region all alive with the departed Pinchians, not as they had shown themselves to the world, nor in their better and happier hours but as doing over again some deed of sin, or in the crisis of life's bitterest sorrow. The popular imagination, indeed, long kept itself busy with the affair of the old Puritan Pinchian and the wizard Maul. The curse which the latter flung from his scaffold was remembered with the very important addition that it had become a part of the Pinchian inheritance. If one of the family did but gurgle in his throat, a bystander would be likely enough to whisper, between jest and earnest, He has Maul's blood to drink. The sudden death of a Pinchian, about a hundred years ago, with circumstances very similar to what have been related of the colonel's exit, was held as giving additional probability to the received opinion on this topic. It was considered, moreover, an ugly and ominous circumstance that Colonel Pinchian's picture, in obedience, it was said, to a provision of his will, remained affixed to the wall of the room in which he died. Those stern, Im Im how do you say that? Immitigable. Im immitigable. Those stern, immit immitigable features seem to symbolize an evil influence, and so darkly to mingle the shadow of their presence with the sunshine of the passing hour that no good thoughts or purposes could ever spring up and blossom there. To the thoughtful mind, there will be no tinge of superstition in what we figuratively express by affirming that the ghost of a dead progenitor perhaps as a portion of his own punishment, 
is often doomed to become the evil genius of his family. Mm. And uh, interest uh, that, that's uh, that's uh, I, you know I d did not expect to see like an, a, a capitalized evil genius like that. I mean, when you think evil genius, that's kind of like like nineteen fifties um, you know science fiction stuff. Man, it's, uh, boy, this book's kind of interesting. Um, oh, Dithy says that was your recollection too that the actions of the previous generations carry over. Yeah, okay. Oh, Anya's not a fan of the uh, Scarlet Letter. Yeah, I, I, I liked it, but it, it was it felt very drawn out. It was very drawn. I mean, th th this one here has it, it's very very de uh, descriptive uh, in its language, but but it seems to flow fast. The Scarlet Letter. It was that was, and, and, and it was also really really sad too. Um, you know, it. I mean, after after, yeah, it, I, I I I didn't like the way it ended, but I suppose I mean. It, it 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 would end like that for like a lot of people, I, I suppose. But yeah, didn't didn't like the end. Uh, I mean, uh, your son did a great paper of that in in uh, uh, Which one, a Scarlet Letter or or this one here, Rose? You, your your son wrote a paper on this. On the Scarlet Letter, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it it, it was it was a, it was a good read. Um, and it was structured very in, in a very interesting way as well. Uh, yeah, it was like alternating between chapters, between different um, uh, uh, events, following different events. Um, but yeah, yeah it, uh, it, it, I, I don't know. I, you know I mean, after living a hard life, you want to see someone get some satisfaction. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Don't know. Anyway, okay, let's get back to here. The, the Pinchians. Okay, so there's there's a lot of guilt. And uh, okay, so it seems that the the descendants of the Pinchian family. Uh, I mean, okay, so everyone, everyone, even outside the family, knows about the curse that that was put on by Matthew Mall. And uh, I guess some of the family suspect that old man Pinchian had done them wrong. I suspect. Everyone reads Scarlet Letter in high school. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that was not in our. But actually, our, our school was a bit different, I guess. We, we it was not on our reading list. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um. There we go. Okay. The Pinchians, in brief, lived along for the better part of two centuries with perhaps less of outward vicissitude than has attended most other New England families during the same period of time. Possessing very distinctive traits of their own, they nevertheless took the general characteristics of the little community in which they dwelt, a town noted for its frugal, discreet, well-ordered, and home-loving inhabitants, as well as for the somewhat confined scope of its sympathies. But in which, be it said, there are odder individuals, and now and then stranger occurrences, than one meets with almost anywhere else. During the Revolution, the Pinchian of that epoch, adopting the royal side, became a refugee, but repented and made his reappearance just at the point of time to preserve the House of the Seven Gables from confiscation. For the last seventy years, the most noted event in the Pinchian annals had been likewise the heaviest calamity that ever befell the race, no less than the violent death, for so it was adjudged, of one member of the family by the criminal act of another. Certain circumstances attending this fatal occurrence had brought the deed irresistibly home to a nephew of the deceased Pinchian. The young man was tried and convicted of the crime, but either the circumstantial nature of the evidence, and possibly some lurking doubts in the breast of the executive, or, lastly, an argument of greater weight in a republic than it could have been under a monarchy, the high respectability and political influence of the criminal's connections had availed to mitigate his doom from death to perpetual imprisonment. This sad affair had chanced about thirty years before the action of our story. 
Latterly, there were rumors which few believed, and only one or two felt greatly interested in, that this long-buried man was likely, for some reason or other, to be summoned forth from his living tomb. Hmm, okay, one second. Let's, hang on. There's this, okay, so he, he was given life in jail for killing another Pinchian. Uh, latterly, there were rumors which few believed, okay, this long-buried man, when they said the long-buried man, summoned forth from, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure uh, exactly what that means. Does that mean that the, are they, are they, are they talking about the dude who got sentenced to jail, right, for, for, the, for the murder? Uh, to be summoned forth from his living tomb. Or are they talking about old man Pinchian? I'm not quite sure, not quite sure what that means. Um, you don't want to go, uh, no spoilers, but the chapter with the fly. Um, I, I don't recall the chapter with the fly. What? Books in the dino age? What? Good I, I I have no idea what's going on in chat either. <laughs> uh, yeah, cell is a tomb. Yeah, that's but, but but when it says to be summoned forth from his living tomb, does that mean like uh, he he was he was he was so well connected that even though he was given like 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 life in jail, uh, he yeah he 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 was actually like uh, like let let out basically. Is is that what that mean? Is that what that mean? I I I think I I think that's what that's supposed to be saying. All right. I I don't know. Who know? I don't know. We'll, we'll we'll figure it out as we go. All right. That's right. I yeah. I uh, boy. I I I muddle my way through life every day like that, William. All right. It is essential to say a few words respecting the victim of this now almost forgotten murder. He was an old bachelor, and possessed of great wealth, in addition to the house and real estate, which constituted what remained of the ancient Pintian property. Being of an eccentric and melancholy turn of mind, and greatly given to rummaging old records and hearkening to old traditions, he had brought himself, it is averred, to the conclusion that Matthew Maul, the wizard, had been foully wronged out of his homestead if not out of his life. Such being the case, and he and the old bachelor in possession of the ill-gotten spoil, with the black stain of blood sunken deep into it, and still to be scented by conscientious nostrils, the question occurred whether it were not imperative upon him, even at this late hour, to make restitution to Maul's posterity. To a man living so much in the past, and so little in the present, as the secluded and antiquarian old bachelor, a century and a half seemed not so vast a period as to obviate the propriety of substituting right for wrong. It was the belief of those who knew him best that he would positively have taken the very singular step of giving up the House of the Seven Gables to the representative of Matthew Moore but for the unspeakable tumult which a suspicion of the old gentleman's project awakened among his Pinchian relatives. Their exertions had the effect of suspending his purpose, but it was feared that he would perform, after death, by the operation of his last will, what he had so hardly been prevented from doing in his proper lifetime. But there is no one thing which men so rarely do, whatever the provocation or inducement, as to bequeath patrimonial property away from their own blood. They, they may love other individuals far better than their relatives. They may even cherish dislike or positive hatred to the latter. But yet, in view of death, the strong prejudice of propinquity revives and impels the testator to send down his estate in the line marked out by custom so immemorial that it looks like nature. In all the Pinchians, this feeling had the energy of disease. 
It was too powerful for the conscientious scruples of the old bachelor, at whose death, accordingly, the mansion house, together with most of his other riches, passed into the possession of his next legal representative. Uh, yes, yes, w w uh, William is being, uh, is, is being a little uh, saucy. This was a nephew, the cousin of the miserable young man who had been convicted of the uncle's murder. The new heir, up to the period of his accession, was reckoned rather a dissipated youth, but had at once reformed and made himself an exceedingly respectable member of society. In fact, he showed more of the Pinchian quality, and had won a higher eminence in the world than any of his race since the time of the original Puritan. Applying himself in earlier manhood to the study of law, and having a natural tendency towards office, he had attained, many years ago, to a judicial situation in some inferior court, which gave him for life the very desirable and imposing title of judge. Later he had engaged in politics and served a part of two terms in Congress, besides making a considerable figure in both branches of the state legislature. Judge Pinchian was unquestionably an honor to his race. He had built himself a country seat within a few miles of his native town, and there spent such portions of his time as could be spared from public service in the display of every grace and virtue, as a newspaper phrased it on the eve of an election, befitting the Christian, the good citizen, the horticulturalist, and the gentleman. Kind of interesting. Like, like they, they keep referring to the family as a as a race. It makes it sound they're they're very. Um, you know, they have like like a big extended family. Um, but but it's but it's, it's but it's still very like isolated from the rest of everyone else. Uh, there were few of the Pinchians left to sun themselves in the glow of the judge's prosperity. In respect to natural increase, the breed had not thriven. It appeared rather to be dying out. The only members of the family known to be extant were first the judge himself, and a single surviving son who was now travelling in Europe. Next, the thirty years prisoner, already alluded to, and a sister of the latter, who occupied in an extremely retired manner the House of the Seven Gables, in which she had a life estate by the will of the old bachelor. She was understood to be wretchedly poor, and seemed to make it her choice to remain so. Inasmuch as her affluent cousin, the judge, had repeatedly offered her all the comforts of life, either in the old mansion or his own modern residence, the last and youngest Pinchian was a little country girl of seventeen, the daughter of another of the judge's cousins, who had married a young woman of no family or property, and died early and in poor circumstances. His widow had recently taken another husband. As for Matthew Maul's posterity, it was supposed now to be extinct. For a very long period, after the witchcraft delusion, however, the Mauls had continued to inhabit the town where their progenitor had suffered so unjust a death. To all appearance, they were a quiet, honest, well-meaning race of people, cherishing no malice against individuals or the public for the wrong which had been done them or, if at their own fireside, they transmitted from father to child any hostile recollection of the wizard's fate and their lost patrimony. It was never acted upon or openly expressed, nor would it have been singular had they ceased to remember that the House of the Seven Gables was resting its heavy framework on a foundation that was rightfully their own. There is something so massive stable and almost irresistibly imposing in the exterior presentment of established rank and great possessions that their very existence seems their very existence seems to give them a right to exist at least so excellent a counterfeit of right 
that few poor and humble men have moral force enough to question it, even in their secret minds. Such is the case now, after so many ancient prejudices have been overthrown, and it was far more in it was far more so in anti revolutionary days, when the aristocracy could venture to be proud, and the low were content to be abased. Thus the Malls, at all events, kept their resentments within their own breasts. They were generally poverty-stricken, always plebeian and obscure, working with unsuccessful diligence at handicrafts, laboring on the wharves or following the sea as sailors before the mast, living here and there about the town, in hired tenements, and coming finally to the almshouse as the natural home of their old age. At last, after creeping, as it were, for such a length of time, along the utmost verge of the opaque puddle of obscurity, they had taken that downright plunge, which sooner or later is the destiny of all families, whether princely or plebeian. For thirty years past, neither town record, nor gravestone, nor the directory, nor the knowledge or memory of man bore any trace of Matthew Maul's descendants. His blood might possibly exist elsewhere. Here, where its lowly current could be traced so far back, it had ceased to keep an onward course. Mm. So long as any of the race were to be found, they had been marked out from other men, not strikingly, nor as with a sharp line, but with an effect that was felt, rather than spoken of, by an hereditary character of reserve. Their companions, or those who endeavoured to become such, grew conscious of a circle round about the malls, within the sanctity or the spell of which, in spite of an exterior of sufficient frankness and good fellowship, it was impossible for any man to step. It was this indefinable peculiarity, perhaps, that, by insulating them from human aid, kept them always so unfortunate in life. It certainly operated to prolong, in their case, and to confirm to them, as their only inheritance, those feelings of repugnance and superstitious terror with which the people of the town, even after awakening from their frenzy, continued to regard the memory of the reputed witches. The mantle, or rather the ragged cloak, of old Matthew Maul had fallen upon his children. They were half believed to inherit mysterious attributes. The family eye was said to possess strange power, among other good-for-nothing properties and privileges, one was especially assigned them, that of, ex that of exercising an influence over people's dreams. The Pinchians, if all stories were true, haughtily as they bore themselves in the noonday streets of their native town, were no better than bond-servants to these plebeian malls on entering the topsy-turvy commonwealth of sleep. Modern psychology, it may be, will endeavor to reduce these alleged necromancies within a system, instead of rejecting them as altogether fabulous. A descriptive paragraph or two, treating of the seven gabled mansion, in its more recent aspect, will bring this preliminary chapter to a close. The street in which it upreared its venerable peaks has long ceased to be a fashionable quarter of the town, so that, though the old edifice was surrounded by habitations of modern date, they were mostly small, built entirely of wood, and typical of the most plodding uniformity of common life. Doubtless, however, the whole story of human existence may, may be latent in each of them, but with no picturesqueness externally that can attract the imagination or sympathy to seek it there. But as for the old structure of our story, its white oak frame and its boards, shingles and crumbling plaster, and even the huge clustered chimney in the midst seem to constitute only the least and meanest part of its reality. 
So much of mankind's varied experience had passed there, so much had been suffered, and something, too, enjoyed, that the very timbers were oozy, as with the moisture of a heart. It was itself like a great human heart, with a life of its own, and full of rich and sombre reminiscences. The deep projection of the second story gave the house such a meditative look that you could not pass it without the idea that it had secrets to keep and an eventful history to moralize upon. In front, just on the edge of the unpaved sidewalk, grew the Pinchian elm, which, in reference to such trees as one usually meets with, might well be termed gigantic. It had been planted by a great-grandson of the first Pinchian, and though now fourscore years of age, or perhaps nearer a hundred, was still in its strong and broad maturity, throwing its shadow from side to side of the street, overtopping the seven gables, and sweeping the whole black roof with its pendant foliage. It gave beauty to the old edifice, and seemed to make it a part of nature. The street, having been widened about forty years ago, the front gable was now precisely on a line with it. On either side extended a ruinous wooden fence of open lattice work, through which could be seen a grassy yard, and, especially in the angles of the building, an enormous fertility of burdocks with leaves. It's hardly an exaggeration to say two or three feet long. Behind the house there appeared to be a garden, which undoubtedly had once been extensive, but was now infringed upon by other enclosures, or shut in by habitations and outbuildings that stood on another street. It would be an omission, trifling indeed, but unpardonable, were we to forget, the green moss that had long since gathered over the projections of the windows, and on the slopes of the roof, nor must we fail to direct the reader's eye to a crop, not of weeds, but flower shrubs, which were growing aloft in the air, not a great way from the chimney, in the nook between two of the gables. They were called Alice's Posies. The tradition was that a certain Alice Pinchian had flung up the seeds in sport, and that the dust of the street and the decay of the roof gradually formed a kind of soil for them, out of which they grew, when Alice had long been in her grave. However the flowers might have come there, no, however the flowers might have come there, it was both sad and sweet to observe how nature adopted to herself this desolate, decaying, gusty, rusty, old house of the Pinchian family, and how the ever-returning summer did her best to gladden it with tender beauty, and grew melancholy in the effort. There is one other feature— very essential to be noticed, but which we greatly fear may damage any picturesque and romantic impression which we have been willing to throw over our sketch of this respectable edifice. In the front gable, under the impending brow of the second story, and contiguous to the street, was a shop door, divided horizontally in the midst, and with a window for its upper segment, such as is often seen in dwellings of a somewhat ancient date. This same shop-door had been a subject of no slight mortification to the present occupant of the august Pinchian house, as well as to some of her predecessors. The matter is disagreeably delicate to handle, but since the reader must needs be let into the secret, he will please to understand that, about a century ago, the head of the Pinchians found himself involved in serious financial difficulties. The fellow, a gentleman as he styled himself, can hardly have been other than a spurious interloper, for instead of seeking office from the king or the royal governor, or urging his hereditary claim to eastern lands, he bethought himself of no better avenue to wealth than by cutting a shop-door through the side of his ancestral residence. It was the custom of the time, indeed, for merchants to store their goods and transact business in their own dwellings, 
But there was something pitifully small in this old Pinchian's mode of setting about his commercial operations. It was whispered that, with his own hands, all beruffled as they were, he used to give change for a shilling, and would turn a halfpenny twice over to make sure that it was a good one. Beyond all question, he had the blood of a petty huckster in his veins, through whatever channel it may have found its way there. Immediately on his death, the shop door had been locked, bolted, and barred, and down to the period of our story, had probably never once been opened. The old counter, shelves, and other fixtures of the little shop remained just as he had left them. It used to be affirmed that the dead shopkeeper, in a white wig, a faded velvet coat, an apron at his waist, and his ruffles carefully turned back from his wrists, might be seen through the chinks of the shutters, any night of the year, ransacking his till or poring over the dingy pages of his day book. From the look of unutterable woe upon his face, it appeared to be his doom to spend eternity in a vain effort to make his accounts balance. And now, in a very humble way, as will be seen, we proceed to open our narrative. That was the end of chapter one. Good gracious, that was long. That is one long setup for what is to come. Man, it was good, though. It was good. We'll, we'll, we'll get on with chapter two in just a minute. <gasps> wow, it's almost 11. Oh boy, it's closing in on 1130 already. Okay, you know, I'm going to have to do a quick little uh, page count just to make sure um, <laughs> we got time. I don't know if I can do another hour and a half. Man. All righty. So far, so good. Yeah, you liking it there, Divey? Let's do a quick little page count. Let's do it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 30. 30, 30 pages. Ooh, boy. Yeah, okay, we, we can we can do that. Yeah, we can do that. Man, sounds like 2020 working even... Uh, yeah! Working even after you die to pay your bills. Yeah. 2020 is the gear that keeps on giving, that's for sure. Man. Okay. Having a little a sip of water here. Okay, so Dithy has read this before. And this is my first time reading it. So far, so good. But that was a lot. That was a lot of backstory. Okay, so here we go. We, 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 we get one more chapter done. And actually, this is probably going to take us um, probably till about quarter past quarter past the hour. Yeah, I think about forty-five minutes to get thirty pages done. Probably. Okay. Let's do it. Chapter 2. The Little Shop Window It still lacked half an hour of sunrise. Hey, there, Rose, still with us. Nice, nice, nice. It still lacked half an hour of sunrise when Miss Hepzibah Pinchian, uh, we will not say, awoke, it being doubtful whether the poor lady had so much as closed her eyes during the brief night of midsummer. But at all events, arose from her solitary pillow and began what it would be mockery to term the adornment of her person. Far from us be the indecorum of assisting, even in imagination, at a maiden lady's toilet. Our story must therefore await Miss Hepzibah at the threshold of her chamber, only presuming, meanwhile, to note some of the heavy sighs that laboured from her bosom, with little restraint as to their lugubrious depth and volume of sound, inasmuch as they could be audible to nobody save a disembodied listener like ourself. The old maid was alone in the old house. Alone except for a certain respectable and orderly young man, an artist in the daguerreotype line, who for about three months back had been a lodger in a remote gable, quite a house by itself, indeed, with locks, bolts, and oaken bars on all the intervening doors. Inaudible, consequently, were poor Miss Hepzibah's gusty sighs, 
inaudible the creaking joints of her stiffened knees as she knelt down by the bedside, and inaudible, too, by mortal ear, but heard with all comprehending love and pity in the farthest heaven that almost agony of prayer, now whispered, now a groan, now a struggling silence, wherewith she besought the divine assistance throughout the day. Evidently, this is to be a day of more than ordinary trial to Miss Hepzibah, who, for above a quarter of a century gone by, has dwelt in strict seclusion, taking no part in the business of life, and just as little in its intercourse and pleasures. Not with such fervor praised the torpid recluse, looking forward to the cold, sunless, stagnant calm of a day that is like to be, uh, looking forward to the cold, sunless, stagnant calm of a day that is to be like innumerable yesterdays. The maiden lady's devotions are concluded. Will she now issue forth over the threshold of our story? Not yet, by many moments. First, every drawer in the tall, old-fashioned bureau is to be opened, with difficulty and with a succession of spasmodic jerks, then. All must close again with the same fidgety reluctance. There's a rustling of stiff silks, a tread of backward and forward footsteps to and fro across the chamber. We suspect, Miss Hepzibah, moreover, of taking a step upward into a chair in order to give heedful regard to her appearance on all sides and at full length, in the oval, dingy-framed toilet-glass that hangs above her table. Truly. Well, indeed, who would have thought it? Is all this precious time to be lavished on the matutinal, matutinal repair and botifying of an elderly person who never goes abroad, whom nobody ever visits, and from whom, when she shall have done her utmost, it were the best charity to turn one's eyes another way. Now she's almost ready. Let us pardon her one uh, let us pardon her one other pause, for it is to for it is given to the sole sentiment, or we might better say, heightened and rendered intense, as it has been by sorrow and seclusion, uh, to the strong passion of her life. We heard the turning of a key in a small lock. She has opened a secret drawer of an escritoire, and is probably looking at a certain miniature done in Melbourne's most perfect style, and representing a face worthy of no less delicate a pencil. It was once our good fortune to see this picture. It is a likeness of a young man, in a silken dressing-gown of an old fashion, the soft richness of which is well adapted to the countenance of reverie, with its full, tender lips and beautiful eyes, that seem to indicate uh, not so much capacity of thought as gentle and voluptuous emotion. Of the possessor of such features we shall have a right to ask nothing, except that he would take the rude world easily, and make himself happy in it. Can it have been an early lover of Miss Hepzibah? No, she never had a lover. Poor thing, how could she? Nor ever knew, by her own experience, what love technically means. And yet her undying faith and trust, her fresh remembrance and continual devotedness towards the original of that miniature, have been the only substance for her heart to feed upon. She seems to have put aside the miniature, and is standing again before the toilet glass. There are tears to be wiped off, a few more footsteps to and fro, and here, at last, with another pitiful sigh, like a gust of chill, damp wind out of a long-closed vault, the door of which has accidentally been set ajar, here comes Miss Hepzibah Pynchian. Forth she steps into the dusky, time-darkened passage, a tall figure clad in black silk with a long and shrunken waist, feeling her way towards the stairs like a near-sighted person, as in truth she is. Actually, you know, I'm just going to stop for just a second here. Um, the, um, 
this really this really reminds me of um of that play um, uh, uh, um our town um it, it just just like the whole like narration and setting the stage of of, of everything like that I, I, I don't know if um that, that's pretty yeah i don't know i know, that, that, i just keep thinking about that as i'm reading this all right okay. Uh, the sun, meanwhile, if not already above the horizon, was ascending nearer and nearer to its verge. A few clouds, floating high upward, caught some of the earliest light, and threw down its golden gleam on the windows of all the houses in the street, not forgetting the house of the seven gables, which, many such sunrises as it has witnessed, looked cheerfully at the present one. The reflected radiance served to show, uh, pretty distinctly, the aspect and arrangement of the room which Hepzibah entered after descending the stairs. It was a low-studded room, with a beam across the ceiling, panelled with dark wood, and having a large chimney-piece, set round with pictured tiles, but now closed by an iron fireboard, through which ra ran the funnel of a modern stove. There was a carpet on the floor, originally of rich texture, but so worn and faded in these latter years that its once brilliant figure had quite vanished into one indistinguishable hue. In the way of furniture there were two tables, one constructed with perplexing intricacy and exhibiting as many feet as a centipede, the other most delicately wrought with four long and slender legs, so apparently frail that it was almost incredible what a length of time the ancient tea-table had stood upon them. Half a dozen chairs stood about the room, straight and stiff, and so ingeniously contrived for the discomfort of the human person that they were irksome even to sight, and conveyed the ugliest possible idea of the state of society to which they could have been adapted. One exception there was, however, in a very antique elbow chair, with a high back carved elaborately in oak, and a roomy depth within its arms that made up by its spacious comprehensiveness for the lack of any of those artistic curves which abound in a modern chair. As for ornamental articles of furniture, we recollect but two, if such they may be called. One was a map of the Pinchian territory at the eastward, not engraved, but the handiwork of some skilful old draftsman, and grotesquely illuminated with pictures of Indians and wild beasts, among which was seen a lion, the natural history of the region being as little known as its geography, which was put down most fantastically awry. The other adornment was the portrait of old Colonel Pinchian, at two-thirds length representing the stern features of a puritanic-looking personage in a skull-cap, with a laced band and a grisly beard, holding a Bible in one hand and in the other uplifting an iron sword-hilt the latter object, being more successfully depicted by the artist, stood out in far greater prominence than the sacred volume. Face to face with this picture, on entering the apartment, Miss Hepzibah Pinchian came to a pause, regarding it with a singular scowl, a strange contortion of the brow, which, by people who did not know her, would probably have been interpreted as an expression of bitter anger and ill-will. But it was no such thing. She, in fact, felt a reverence for the pictured visage, of which only a far-descended and time-stricken virgin could be susceptible. And this forbidding scowl was the innocent result of her near-sightedness, and an, and an effort so to concentrate her powers of vision as to substitute a firm outline of the object instead of a vague one. We must linger for a moment on this unfortunate expression of poor Hepzibah's brow. Her scowl, as the world, or such part of it as sometimes caught a transitory glimpse of her at the window, wickedly persisted in calling it. Her scowl, I had done Miss Hepzibah... What? That's a weird sentence. Let's go back. Her scowl, as the world, or such part of it as sometimes caught a transitory glimpse of her at the window, 
wickedly persisted in calling it. Her scowl had done Miss Hepzibar a very ill office in establishing her character as an ill-tempered old maid. Nor does it appear improbable that by often gazing at herself in a dim looking-glass and perpetually encountering her own frown with its ghostly sphere, she had been led to interpret the expression almost as unjustly as the world did. "'How miserably cross I look!' she must often have whispered to herself, and ultimately have fancied herself so, by a sense of inevitable doom. But her heart never frowned. It was naturally tender, sensitive, and full of little tremors and palpitations, all of which weaknesses it retained, while her visage was growing so perversely stern and even fierce.' nor had Hepzibah ever had uh, nor had Hepzibah ever any hardihood except what came from the very warmest nook in her affections. All this time, however, we are loitering faint heartedly on the threshold of our story. They've said that about uh, five or six times now. They're like, yeah, yeah, we're getting to the story, getting to the story. All this time, however, we are loitering faint-heartedly on the threshold of our story. In very truth, we have an invincible reluctance to disclose what Miss Hepzibah Pinchian was about to do. It has already been observed that in the basement story of the gable fronting on the street, an unworthy ancestor nearly a century ago had fitted up a shop. Ever since the old gentleman retired from the trade and fell asleep under his coffin lid, not only the shop door but the inner arrangements had been suffered to remain unchanged, while the dust of ages gathered inch deep over the shelves and counter and partly filled an old pair of scales, as if it were of value enough to be weighed. It treasured itself up, too, in the half-open till, where there still lingered a base sixpence, worth neither more nor less than the hereditary pride which had here been put to shame. Such had been the state and condition of the little shop in old Hepzibah's childhood, when she and her brother used to play at hide-and-seek in its forsaken precincts. So it had remained, until a few days passed. Uh, uh, Dinety thinks, yeah, 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 get it all trimmed down, yeah, yeah. Get to the point, get to the point. But now, though the shop window was still closely curtained from the public gaze, a remarkable change had taken place in its interior. The rich and heavy festoons of cobweb, which it had cost a long ancestral succession of spiders their life's labor to spin and weave, had been carefully brushed away from the ceiling. The counter, shelves, and floor had all been scoured, and the latter was overstrewn with fresh blue sand. The brown scales, too, had evidently undergone rigid discipline, in an unavailing effort to rub off the rust— which, alas, had eaten through and through their substance. Neither was the little old shop any longer empty of merchantable goods. A curious eye, a privilege to take an account of stock and investigate behind the counter, would have discovered a barrel, yea, two or three barrels and half, ditto, one containing flour, another apples, and a third, perhaps, Indian meal. There was likewise a square box of pine wood, full of soap and bars, also another of the same size, in which were tallow candles, ten to the pound, a small stock of brown sugar, some white beans and split peas, and a few other commodities of low price, and such as are constantly in demand, made up the bulkier portion of the merchandise. It might have been taken for a ghostly or phantasmagoric reflection of the old shopkeeper, Pinchian's shabbily provided shelves, save that some of the articles were of a description and outward form that could hardly have been known in his day. For instance, there was a glass pickle jar filled with fragments of Gibraltar rock. Not indeed. Uh, isn't uh, Gibraltar rock is uh, candy? Um... Uh, I'm, I'm trying. Well, well, I, I don't know what they call it here in America. Uh, Gibraltar rock. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure there's an American name for it. Uh, not, not indeed splinters of the veritable stone foundation of the famous fortress, but bits of delectable. Oh, this is right there. Bits of delectable candy, neatly done up in white paper. Jim Crow, moreover, was seen executing his world-renowned dance in gingerbread. A party of leaden dragoons were galloping along one of the shelves in equipments and uniform of modern cut, and there were some sugar figures with no strong resemblance to the humanity of any epoch, but less unsatisfactorily representing our own fashions than those of a hundred years ago. Another phenomenon, still more strikingly modern, was a package of Lucifer matches, which in old times would have been thought actually to borrow their instantaneous flame from the nether fires of Tophet. In short, to bring the matter at once to a point, it was incontrovertibly evident that someone had taken the shop and fixtures of the long-retired and forgotten Mr. Pynchian, and was about to renew the enterprise of that departed worthy, with a different set of customers. Who could this bold adventurer be? And of all places in the world, why had he chosen the House of the Seven Gables as the scene of his commercial speculations? We return to the elderly maiden. She at length withdrew her eyes from the dark countenance of the colonel's portrait, heaved a sigh. Indeed, her breast was a very cave of Aeolus that morning, and stepped across the room on tiptoe, as is the customary gait of elderly women. Passing through an intervening passage, she opened a door that communicated with the shop just now so elaborately described. Owing to the projection of the upper story, and still more to the thick shadow of the Pinchian elm, which stood almost directly in front of the gable, the twilight here was still much akin to night as morning. Another heavy sigh from Miss Hepzibah. After a moment's pause on the threshold, peering towards the window with her near-sighted scowl, as if frowning down some bitter enemy, she suddenly projected herself into the shop. The haste, and as it were, the galvanic impulse of the movement were really quite startling. Nervously, in a sort of frenzy, we might almost say, she began to busy herself in arranging some children's playthings and other little wares on the shelves and at the shop window. In the aspect of this dark, arrayed, pale-faced, lady-like old figure, there was a deeply tragic character that contrasted irreconcilably with the ludicrous pettiness of her employment. It seemed a queer anomaly that so gaunt and dismal a personage should take a toy in hand, a miracle that the toy did not vanish in her grasp, a miserably absurd idea that she should go on perplexing her stiff and somber intellect with the question how to tempt little boys into her premises. Yet such is undoubtedly her object. Now she places a gingerbread elephant against the window, but with so tremulous a touch that it tumbles upon the floor with the dismemberment of three legs and its trunk. It has ceased to be an elephant, and has become a few bits of musty gingerbread. There, again, she has upset a tumbler of marbles, all of which roll different ways, and each individual marble devil directed into the most difficult obscurity that it can find. Heaven help our poor old Hepzibah, and forgive us for taking a ludicrous view of her position, as her rigid and rusty frame goes down upon its hands and knees in quest of the absconding marbles, we positively feel so much the more inclined to shed tears of sympathy from the very fact that we must needs turn aside and laugh at her. For here, and if we fail to impress it suitably upon the reader, it is our own fault, not that of the theme. Here is one of the truest points of melancholy interest that occur in, e in ordinary life. It was the final throw of what called itself old gentility. A lady who had fed herself from childhood with the shadowy food of aristocratic rem reminiscences, and whose religion it was that a lady's hand soils itself irremediably by doing aught for bread. 
This born lady, after sixty years of narrowing means, is fain to step down from her pedestal of imaginary rank. Poverty, treading closely at her heels for a lifetime, has come up with her at last. She must earn her own food or starve. And we have stolen upon Miss Hepzibah Pinchian too, irre too irreverently at the instant of time when the patrician lady is to be transformed into the plebeian woman. In this republican country, amid the fluctuating waves of our social life, somebody is always at the drowning point. The tragedy is enacted with as continual uh, a repetition as that of a popular drama on a holiday, and nevertheless is felt as deeply, perhaps, as when an hereditary noble sinks below his order. More deeply, since with us rank is the grosser substance of wealth and a splendid establishment, and has no spiritual existence after the death of these, but dies hopelessly along with them. And therefore, since we have been unfortunate enough to introduce our heroine at so inauspicious a juncture, we would entreat for a mood of due solemnity in the spectators of her fate. Let us behold in poor Hepzibah, the immemorial lady, two hundred years old on this side of the water, and thrice as many on the other, with her antique portraits, pedigrees, coats of arms, records, and traditions, and her claim, as joint heiress, to that princely territory at the eastward, no longer a wilderness, but a populous fertility. Born, too, in Pinchian Street, under the Pinchian Elm, and in the Pinchian House, where she has spent all her days, reduced. Now in that very house to be the hucksteress of a scent shop. This business of setting up a petty shop is almost the only resource of women, in circumstances at all similar to those of our unfortunate recluse. With her near-sightedness and those tremulous fingers of hers, at once inflexible and delicate, she could not be a seamstress. Although her sampler of fifty years gone by exhibited some of the most recondite specimens of ornamental needlework, a school for little children had been often in her thoughts, and at one time she had begun a review of her early studies in the New England Primer, with a view to prepare herself for the office of instructress. But the love of children had never been quickened in Hepzibah's heart, and was now torpid, if not extinct. She watched the little people of the neighborhood from her chamber window, and doubted whether she could tolerate a more intimate acquaintance with them. Besides, in our day, the very ABC has become a science greatly too abstruse to be any longer taught by pointing a pin from letter to letter. A modern child could teach old Hepzibah more than old Hepzibah could teach the child. So, with many a cold, deep heartquake at the idea of at last coming into sordid contact with the world, from which she had so long kept aloof, while every added day of seclusion had rolled another stone against the cavern door of her hermitage, the poor thing bethought herself of the ancient shop window, the rusty scales and dusty till. She might have held back a little longer, but another circumstance, not yet hinted at, had, had somewhat hastened her decision. Her humble preparations, therefore, were duly made, and the enterprise was now to be commenced. Nor was she entitled to complain of any remarkable singularity in her fate. For in the town of her nativity we might point to several little shops of a similar description, some of them in houses as ancient as that of the Seven Gables, and one or two, it may be, where a decayed gentlewoman stands behind the counter, 
as grim an image of family pride as Miss Hepzibah Pinchian herself. It was overpoweringly ridiculous. We must honestly confess it. The deportment of the maiden lady, while setting her shop in order for the public eye, she stole on tiptoe to the window as cautiously as if she conceived some bloody-minded villain to be watching behind the elm tree with intent to take her life. Stretching out her long, lank arm, she put a paper of pearl buttons, a jew's harp, or whatever this small article might be, in its destined place, and straightway vanished back into the dusk, as if the world need never hope for another glimpse of her. It might have been fancied, indeed, that she expected to minister to the wants of the community unseen, like a disembodied divinity or enchantress, holding forth her bargains to the reverential and awe-stricken purchaser in an invisible hand. But, Hepzibah had no such flattering dream. She was well aware that she must ultimately come forward and stand revealed in her proper individuality. But like other sensitive persons, she could not bear to be observed in the gradual process, and chose rather to flash forth on the world's astonished gaze at once. The inevitable moment was not much longer to be delayed. The sunshine might now be seen stealing down the front of the opposite house, from the windows of which came a reflected gleam, struggling through the boughs of the elm tree, and enlightening the interior of the shop more distinctly than heretofore. The town appeared to be waking up. A baker's cart had already rattled through the street, chasing away the latest vestige of night's sanctity with the jingle-jangle of its dissonant bells. A, min a, a milkman was distributing the contents of his cans from door to door, and the harsh peal of a fisherman's conch shell was heard far off, around the corner. None of these tokens escaped Hepzibah's notice. The moment had arrived. To delay longer would be only to lengthen out her misery. Nothing remained except to take down the bar from the shop door, leaving the entrance free. More than free. Welcome, as if all were household friends. To every passer-by whose eyes might be attracted by the commodities at the window. This last act Hepzibah now performed, letting the bar fall with what smote upon her excited nerves as a most astounding clatter. Then, as if the only barrier betwixt herself and the world had been thrown down, and a flood of evil consequences would come tumbling through the gap, she fled into the inner parlour, threw herself into the ancestral elbow-chair, and wept. Our miserable old Hepzibah. It is a heavy annoyance to a writer who endeavors to represent nature, its various attitudes and circumstances, in a reasonably correct outline and true coloring, that so much of the mean and ludicrous should be hopelessly mixed up with the purest pathos which life anywhere supplies to him. What tragic dignity, for example, can be wrought into a scene like this, how can we elevate our history of retribution for the sin of long ago, when, as one of our most prominent figures, we are compelled to introduce not a young and lovely woman, nor even the stately remains of beauty, storm-shattered by affliction, but a gaunt, sallow, rusty-jointed maiden, in a long-waisted silk gown, and with the strange horror of a turban on her head. Her visage is not even ugly. It is redeemed from insignificance only by the contraction of her eyebrows into a near-sighted scowl. And finally, her great life-trial seems to be that, after sixty years of idleness, she finds it convenient to earn comfortable bread by setting up a shop in a small way. 
Nevertheless, if we look through all the heroic fortunes of mankind, we shall find this same entanglement of something mean and trivial, with whatever is noblest in joy or sorrow. Life is made up of marble and mud, and without all the deeper trust in a comprehensive sympathy above us, we might hence be led to suspect the insult of a sneer, as well as an immitigable frown on the iron countenance of fate. What is called poetic insight is the gift of discerning, in this sphere of strangely mingled elements, the beauty and the majesty which are compelled to assume a garb so sordid.